Microsoft founder Bill Gates spoke at the Economic Club of Washington this week, touching on his career at Microsoft, as well as his philanthropic work and efforts to improve education and health care in the U.S. and abroad. Thank you. His conversation with the president of the Economic Club is an hour. We're very pleased and honored tonight to have Bill Gates as our special guest. Um, as I said at the er outset, uh, this is, in the 25 years of the club, the biggest turnout we've ever had. And I, I don't think it's because the interviewer skills were so great. I think it's uh, because everybody wanted to hear Bill Gates. And I think the reason is because of uh, his extraordinary accomplishments over so many years. Um, I don't think he needs an elaborate introduction, but I just would like to make a couple points. Today, Bill is essentially the, the biggest philanthropist in the world. His business career is also legendary. Um, he left Harvard in uh, the mid-1970s and uh, started a company later named Microsoft. He built it into the largest technology company in the world. And at one point, it was a company that had the highest market value of any company in the world's history, over $600 billion. Um, in doing that, he revolutionized the computer uh, system that we have in our country and, and revolutionized software. And everybody here, I dare say, has used the products of his company, Microsoft. He served as a CEO of that company from 1975, when the was, company was created, to, nine, to, to the year 2000, when he stepped down as a CEO. And from that period of time, he uh, managed to become, in addition to a very successful entrepreneur and businessman and CEO, became the wealthiest man in the world, uh, and by far the wealthiest man in the world. And today um, is one of the wealthiest men in the world. I, Forbes, <laughs> Forbes today, today said that um, he is only the third wealthiest man in the world today with a modest net worth of $49 billion. But had he not done what he's done in philanthropy, his net worth today, according to Forbes, would be $88 billion. Fairly nice number. Um, <laughs> but it's one thing to make a very good company. It's another thing to run a company. It's another thing to make a lot of money, another thing to give it away. But what Bill Gates has done throughout this has managed to keep his feet on the ground, his ego in check, has made himself a very humane person and a very personable person, and has made himself accessible to people. And so the, what people admire about him, not only his extraordinary accomplishments in philanthropy and business, uh, but also the, the person he has become and the person he has let so many other people know. So what I'd like to do tonight is to not only talk about uh, the foundation, let him talk about the foundation, his philanthropic work and his business career, but also some of the things that make him uh, so human and so interesting uh, to talk to. So let me start by saying um, thank you very much for coming, Bill. And I wondered if you ever thought, you know, um, what you could have made of yourself had you finished college. <laughs> um, you know, it's very legendary that you dropped out of Harvard. But seriously, had you not dropped out of Harvard, every parent wants to know, uh, would you recommend to your own children whether they should drop out of college? But had you not, do you think you could have built the company, or was it the dropping out of college two years early that made a big difference? Well, Paul and I, uh, Paul Allen, who's my co-founder, and I saw the very first kid computer on the cover of a magazine. And we'd been talking about the miracle of the chip for three years by then, and we were going, oh, it's going to happen without us. We've got to get involved. This is so important. And so when that product was announced, it was called the Altair, and the company later disappeared, uh, the, um, the, the, you know, we felt like, gosh, we've got to go do it right away. And you know, so school didn't stand in the way of that. I'm actually on leave from Harvard at okay. this point. Uh, as I say, but um, <laughs> well, what did your what did your parent what did your parents say when you said you know you got into Harvard, you had 1590 on your SATs, you were a brilliant student. What did you what did they say when you said you're dropping out? Well, my parents were used to strangeness. Uh, I I'd, <laughs> I'd been breaking them in slowly but surely. They were used to my disappearing in the night in the night to go use computers. They did curb that somewhat. Uh, my senior year of high school, I skipped because there was a job that I was being offered, which was an amazing job to work on this very complicated computer project for TRW. And I got to work with some really brilliant people, so I got to learn a lot more. The people I worked with my senior year of high school said, you should skip college and go get a PhD. And so then I went to my parents and I said, yeah, I think I'm going to skip college. And they said, well, 
You, actually, you should go to college. Uh, and that was good advice, because in terms of social development, uh, it, 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 I never finished my social development, but it helped. Uh, uh, I, I thought when you were in high school, you prepared a program which enabled you to get in classes with mostly girls, as I understand it, so you had a better chance of meeting girls at that time. Is that true? Well, I wasn't very good at meeting them, but boy, they were nearby. Uh, <laughs> And they, and they were, they tended to be the better looking girls for some reason. That, that's the beauty of being in charge of the computer scheduling, uh, is I decided when the classes would meet and who was in the classes, because it was a semi-complicated software problem, and uh, they were super nice to let me do it, and they paid me uh, money to do it, so that was a, 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 great, a great position. Well, you, when you, when you uh, a couple years ago, you were given an honorary degree at Harvard, and you said that uh, you always told your parents you would go back and get your degree. But in your speech, you said that you were assigned to live, I think, in what's called the yard, uh, the yard, and you wanted to live there because there were more girls in that part of uh, Harvard, and you thought it would give you a better opportunity given the fact that there would be so many geeks in that period and you would be outshining the rest of those people, but you said it didn't really work. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. the first year, my freshman year, I lived down in the yard, but then I chose to live up at Radcliffe. Radcliffe, okay. So I, my next two years were up there. And that had this great 50-50 ratio, uh, whereas the river houses had three to one. And I knew three to one, it was hopeless for me. 50-50 uh, didn't do anything for me either. But again, uh, uh, it was a, at least a better background for uh, studying. Well, when you were starting your company, did you actually ever have an ambition to build such a large company? Or what was your ambition at the time? Did you have a business plan that actually led to something like Microsoft becoming what it became? No, the interesting thing is that we always had a contradiction in our company plan, which was the, the we said that there would be a computer on every desk and in every home running Microsoft software, which, you know, that's a plan for a very big company. But in terms of our practical what we thought about, I would constantly be saying, okay, no customer pays me for a year, can I meet the payroll? And so I always had enough cash on hand, because I had a lot of customers go bankrupt. Of our first 13 customers, eight did, did not pay us in full. It was a very flaky business with people coming and going. Uh, fortunately, you know, Radio Shack, Apple, a few good ones got in in that, that early list. So we were really putting one foot ahead of the other, and whenever somebody said to me, hey, what's your plan? I would always say, my plan is to double. You know, clearly we can double. And I said that when we had 100 people, 500 people, 5,000 people. Um, I and, see. And so it, in a way, we were actually being very realistic about what we needed to do and what the income would be. I remember once when the Forbes 400 list came out, and there were, uh, there were no software people on, but there was like Ain Wang, uh, the Intel people are, and I thought, well, that's interesting. If we double a few more times, uh, we might even be on this thing. And, well, but, you know, it, it sort of brought the contradiction of the vision and the let's just plan the next, next doubling in, into focus and, for me. And did you ever consider starting the company or building anywhere other than your hometown area? Because it wasn't then a considered a center for, you know, you know uh, this kind of activity. Now, that was a real decision. Our very first customer, when I dropped out of Harvard, was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I learned how to spell that, uh, went there. Uh, and then we were hiring people. So we ended up with about 15 or 16 people. And it was not the easiest place to take to hire uh, people. So then that first customer got bought by a California company. And so we knew we had to move. So the choice was to move to Silicon Valley and you know, we were kind of worried about the traffic and employee loyalty, or to move to be right at the DFW airport, because we were doing so much business in Asia, we thought that would be really cool, we could just go get on the plane, um, and, or to move back to Seattle. And everybody in the company wanted to move back to Seattle, but I held the decision for two or three months, and eventually decided that would work, that we could create a loyal group there. But it was not, it was completely out of the computer uh, right. game. The computer game, Traditional computer game was on the East Coast. Uh, Boston uh, was the biggest part of it. And then this new game was almost entirely in right. Silicon Valley. And uh, when you mentioned Forbes, when you took your company public, I think it was March of 1986, 
Um, you then became uh, the youngest billionaire, self-made billionaire in the United States, I think the age of 32. Is that something close to right? Yeah, yeah, we were, yeah. We went, when we went public, the valuation was like four or 500 million, but within a few years of being okay. public, the value kept going up. And so when you became a billionaire at a relatively young age, I guess in the early 30s, how did it change your life and did you find people treat, treating you much differently? Did your parents treat you differently or? <laughs> No, I would order cheese on my cheeseburger uh, without hesitation. You know, it, it, was, it was, I was talking to my dad once, and he was saying, when Paul Allen was my partner, he said, yeah, it must be tough for Paul's dad that his son makes more money than he does. And then, you know, I didn't answer my dad, and my dad thought for a second. He said, oh, oh, okay, you make more money than I do. <laughs> I was the best customer of his law firm uh, at the time and subsequently an even better customer of his law firm. I've done very well for the legal profession. Uh, so, now, it, it, I was fanatical. I mean, between the age um, of 18 and at least 30, I was just totally focused on Microsoft. You know, I didn't believe in vacations. Um, I let other people take them a little bit. Uh, you know, I knew everybody's license plate. I knew when they came in, came in the morning, when they left at night. And, I, you know, I was just so excited, so thrilled by the work we were doing and wanting to stay in front of it that the whole notion of what was the company worth or what the stock was worth wasn't that interesting. Sometime in my 30s, Fortune ran an article about uh, giving it away, about how actually giving a lot of wealth to your kids is not necessarily a favor to them. And I remember reading that and thinking, oh, okay, that's something I'll have to think about someday. Uh, I, w right. I was 38 when I got married, um, and then I did have to think about it. Now, you married someone who not only had uh, two college degrees, more, two more than you, but she had the advantage of having them from Duke. And uh, now, uh, as everybody knows, she's your partner in the foundation. It's called the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And how does that work in the foundation? Do you both have to agree on every gift, or how... How do you, do you sort through the gifts, and how do you um, decide what your, your areas of focus are on the foundation? Well, she's, she's an equal partner in this whole thing, which is a lot of fun. You know, to have a project that is deep and complicated, you know, she knows when I get overexcited about something, maybe I've gone too far. You know, she thinks about the people. She is, is great, and she'll pick a few topics that she's more in-depth on than I am, and vice versa, and we love uh, learning from each other. We do at least a couple trips here where we go together. Uh, so in, in 10 days, we'll go off to India for a week together. And then we do three or four trips where each of us will go a different, somewhere, and then you know, we'll get back together and explain what we saw there. And so it's, it's worked very, very well. You know, she knows some of my weaknesses and uh, uh, is very helpful with those things. In fact, she's up, she went up to, uh, she got to ride on Air Force One before I did. Uh, today going up to uh, education That's event right. up in Boston. So when you got your foundation pretty much off the ground in a significant way, you had an earlier foundation, but when you really got it jump started, you contributed $20 billion, I think, at the, at the outset. So what was it like to write a check for $20 billion to? Well, what actually happened was, yeah, the year 2000, uh, Microsoft was valued at over $500 billion, which was a kind of unusual number. Uh, and I thought, well, that, this is a good time to give the stock away. So it's just stock certificates that went into the, the foundation. And then over a, a period of time, those were uh, actually sold, sold. So there's an okay. endowment there that's being managed. What had happened was my dad uh, was retired from his legal career, and a Microsoft executive, Patty Stonecipher, retired, and they were talking about working together. And I thought, okay, Given that I'm still so focused on Microsoft and the only, I don't have that much spare time between Microsoft and family stuff, the, these two will do a pretty good job. And I started, to I started to learn about vaccines and how underfunded they were and what a miracle they were. I'd learned about reproductive health. And so having those people, uh, and already sometime from Melinda, go off and get focused on things seemed to make sense. And so, you know, when you create a foundation, you there's a 5% minimum payout. So, you know, in the year 2000, we created an entity that had to ramp up pretty quickly uh, to spending that 5%. So now um, 
you retired from um, Microsoft essentially in 2008, I guess, and uh, you're still the non-executive chairman, but you're 100% of your time is really in philanthropy now. How did you decide that the two areas you wanted to most focus on were K-12 education in the United States and healthcare in the developing world? How did you pick those and which topics or subject did you not pursue because of those two? Well, we decided that we, our main focus would be whatever the greatest inequity in the world is, something that, that affects uh, life in a very deep way. And that's where we picked global health, where we saw that because the poorest people don't create a market, that there's not much research into things like a malaria vaccine or a diarrheal vaccine. And yet, if you get those vaccines, they're, they can be delivered anywhere. You know, they're delivered in every place in the earth, even places like Somalia with no government. And they have an enduring effect not only on reducing deaths, uh, which is worth a lot, um, but also reducing sickness. Uh, the majority of kids in Africa never develop above uh, 90 IQ because they've had infectious disease that may, means their brain doesn't fully develop. And that, you know, that holds those countries back in a huge way. And then parents who have healthy children choose to have less children. And so sort of the master switch of all problems is if you have too many people, feeding right, them, right. keeping it stable, the environment, everything that counts is, is impossible. So that's why global health became our number one thing. Then we said, well, we should pick a problem in the United States because it really was the incredible education system and stability, that, the brilliance of the American system that allowed Melinda and I to learn, it allowed Microsoft to exist, it allowed Berkshire uh, to be right. built. And so we give a little over a quarter um, to U.S. education just because, you know, we wanted to have a global cause and a, a domestic cause. And that's most of what we do. We've added some things that help poor people in agriculture, water and sanitation. So we're actually a total of three, three divisions now. But um, you must have, everybody you see must be asking you at this point in your life for money in some clever way or subtle way. So you must have gotten used to that. And how do you respond to so many people who do you say go to see the foundation or how do you handle what everybody's always asking you for money i assume yeah uh there's there's a lot of interest in raising money but if you really tell people what your focus is you know it's about global health about poor children right. saving their lives we're very very interested if it's about improving the u.s education system we're very interested if it's outside those areas it's almost you know it's very likely that you know, somebody else should go do that. It's a wonderful thing. Right. But yeah, even a foundation our size has to have some degree of focus to build up expertise, to see where we're going wrong. I think in general foundations, if they did half as many things, they'd probably be right. better off. They would do them with more measurement, more, more of a, a learning curve. And so it works out okay. Uh, you know, there, I, I'm, uh, you know, I can, I can say no. Uh, okay. All right. So um... Warren Buffett taught me how. Well, you, you mentioned Warren Buffett and, and Berkshire. Let me get to that. Uh, you had a relationship with Warren Buffett for a number of years, and one day he, I guess, called you up and said, I want to contribute to your foundation. How did that come about? Yeah, it's a very unusual set of circumstances. I had met Warren back on uh, July 5th, 1991. You know, my mother said uh, that she had Kay Graham and Warren Buffett coming over, and I should come meet them. And I said... You know, I'm busy, Mom, uh, it, which I said to her a lot about a lot of things. But I was still in my ultra-fanatical uh, stage at that point. Uh, and she said, no, no, you have to come by. And I said, Mom, he buys and sells stocks, you know. You know, sometimes stocks are mispriced, and somehow he knows that. That doesn't really <laughs> add to human welfare. Right. Uh, but she said I should come. Uh, and so then I went and met Warren, and he started asking me questions about, you know, why, did, why didn't IBM do what you did? And, you know, why couldn't people see where the computer industry was going? And how is it going to affect different things? And these were questions I'd always wanted somebody to ask me. Right. Uh, and, you know, then I got to ask him about uh, various things, uh, about the businesses he knew. Anyway, so we became pretty deep friends. Uh, we golf together, play bridge together, anything to kind of goof off 
uh, and have a chance to talk. Then tragically, uh, his wife died in, I think, 2004. Uh, and you know, his plan was that she, he would do the making the money and she would uh, run the foundation. Most likely, she would uh, outlive him and, and have lots of time to do it. When that uh, wasn't going to be the case, Warren, completely to our surprise, decided uh, to form, uh, to support five foundations, but a, a very substantial portion, I think 85%, something right. like that, uh, going into our foundation. So that was fantastic, but completely unexpected. So when he called you that day and said, I'm going to give you $30 billion or something like that, what was your reaction? Well, it was, wow, he's really serious about this. He, <laughs> he said to me at one point, uh, you know, the, it, that after uh, about, I think about a year after his wife had died, he said, you know, the logical thing to do would be to, to give this money to your foundation. I said, yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, but he wasn't even suggesting it would happen. He, in fact, he was suggesting it wouldn't happen, but he it was just sort of right. Warren brainstorming. He said, yeah, that would be the logical thing. I said, well, maybe. Uh, and then it was like three months later he called and he said, I'm actually doing that. And I said, you're doing what? Uh, I said, no, I want to give uh, a, a large part of it to your foundation because I like to delegate things. Uh, right. And seriously, Warren has very clear principles. Like, uh, you know, when it comes to running Geico, he counts on Tony nicely to run right. Geico. Uh, and in terms of giving money away, he's picked these various foundations. Uh, right. And he didn't you know, say, he, I'd like to have my name on your foundation. He didn't. didn't no, no. Oh. Warren, we. Well, it was funny. At first, Warren was saying, no, nah, I didn't even want to be a trustee. But he said it in a way that was kind of unusual. So I said to my wife, Melinda, hey, call him and ask him if he really means that. Because he said it kind of in a different right. way. And then he said, nah, yeah, he kind of would like to be a trustee. But that's his, uh, yeah, right. uh, <laughs> he, you know, he has been just totally supportive, gives advice, um, and, you know, helps us think about some of the, the tough issues we face, but it's a lot like he treats the managers of his businesses, that he knows they love their work, he knows they're gonna do their best, you know, all those people want, because they're, they admire Warren so much, they wanna do good work for him, and they know he's available uh, to provide advice. Right. Now, you have uh, obviously had a great career in business and now in philanthropy. How do you compare the intellectual challenge and the excitement you get out of the two different uh, types of endeavors? Yeah, I'd say that I, my career sort of had three phases. There was the early Microsoft days, the first 10 years, where I got to write a lot of code. And you know, I was immensely hands-on. And nobody wrote a line of code without me looking at it. Nobody hired an engineer without me right. interviewing the person. That had a certain perfection to it, that everything you know, had to be in its, the right place. And that was very cool, but then, I couldn't keep that up if I wanted to do a lot of products. So I had to step back and not write code and kind of manage and pick strategies and still pick managers, but not all the people. And so I really had to adjust to kind of a more indirect way of contributing. And there's a lot of mistakes you can make when you first start doing that. The work at the foundation is a lot like that fate, which is the third piece. Is it very similar? Because there's scientists working on malaria vaccine. You decide who to fund. It's going to take a decade before you know if they're going down a dead end or not. There's a lot more complexities politically. You know, issues like K through 12 education are fundamentally going to be decided politically. Mm -hmm. Well, at Microsoft, we didn't, well, other than our antitrust trial, uh, um, whatever you call that, most things were uh, more of an engineering type right. thing. And you know, the marketplace would tell you when you got it right, right, when you got it wrong, and it had kind of this excellent metric. Um, and on, our, on some of our science stuff at the foundation, it is more like that, where you either have it or you don't. It's subject to clear measurement. And the beauty is if you invent a new vaccine, nobody ever uninvents it. If you invent a way that teachers should be compensated, evaluated and compensated, that can right. come uh, actually in Tennessee in the 1980s. They had a pretty good system, but it only lasted for five years, and then it was, was abolished. Well, um, you're, you wrote code for a long time, and you're obviously a software expert. I always wondered two questions you could ask me about your software. 
Um, I'm not a, I'm usually a last adopter, so I'm not the most uh, expert person, but why is it when I turn on my Microsoft software, <laughs> to turn it on I have to have three fingers, uh, alternate, control, and delete <laughs> to push it. Why, what was the theory behind having three different <laughs> buttons you had to push? I never could figure that out. Yeah, when you, when you want to start up the computer, you want to know there's not some funny piece of software in there that's looking at everything you're doing and just pretending that it's the real software. And so there's actually a processor in the keyboard that when it gets that funny sequence, it does a hard reset on the computer. And so you know that it's, it's the boot software. Anyway, uh, we could have picked a, a less obscure sequence. Okay. Okay, uh, all right. So we didn't want it to be confused with normal keystrokes. For a while, people wanted there to be a special button on the computer, but as the com keyboard was further away from the computer, we came up with that. So may maybe we could have done better. Okay, well, all right. Let's work <laughs> worked out pretty well. All right, my other, I only one other question, which is, oh, how? Why can't you have software? Maybe you do in your program where if I send an email to you, but I don't want you to send it to somebody else, you can't forward it. Right now. I send an email to you, and it goes all over the world sometimes. Or not. How, do we, how do you prevent that, or can you prevent that? Yeah, actually, Microsoft Exchange, if you configure it the right way, you can have two things. One is you can have email that cannot be forwarded. The second thing is you can have email that can be forwarded, but the originator sees the trace of every forward and every forward of every forward. Oh. And so the originator can see exactly what's going okay. on. I got it. Now, it's, you have to notify people that that... It's an email, it's a, a traced email like that. The, it, to some degree, as soon as you send somebody an email, in an extreme case, they could take a photograph of their screen, put that in a scanner, and email that photograph off to people. So right. once it's in their brain, and they can retype it right. or they can do the photo, you can't guarantee information doesn't leak out. Uh, and so there's never, you know, there's never a perfect system, but there are systems that make it a lot easier to stop people from I see. forwarding things. Well, back to those days for a moment, uh, when uh, IBM was looking to have somebody provide software, I think you won the RFP or you were the selected, um, and what was it like to get IBM to select you? Was that, uh, were you competing with a lot of other people, and did IBM, why did IBM not say, we want to own the software, that you produced for us. Um, why do you think they didn't want to own that software? Yeah, they, they weren't serious about personal computing. What happened is that IBM became a company with many engineering locations, laboratories. And one of those laboratories was Boca Raton. And Boca Raton did a product that was a complete bomb, a complete wipeout. So they had all these engineers sitting there. So some genius up at headquarters, uh, Armonk, decided hey, we take four years between when we conceive of a product and when we get it done. We should try to get that down to a shorter time period. So let's just take some random product and see if we could get it done quickly. And Boca, so there was a kind of RFP at headquarters to, for labs to bid to show they could use some new methodology. Well, Boca, because they had all these fair people, did this bid where they said they would use outside vendors they would use Intel for the chip, they would use us for the software, and they'd get a product done in two years. And it wasn't that important what the product was. The forecast was to sell 200,000 of them. And so their bid was accepted. It was not a major project. Right. It was just this thing they were doing. And they thought of it as a toy computer. Uh, it, it had an optional disk, but it didn't have a hard disk or anything. Well, this group at Boca Raton was a very good group. It was fantastic working with them. And we made the thing more powerful than maybe headquarters understood, but that was the magic of the microprocessor, and we wanted to do that. Well, what happened is this thing ships in um, uh, November 1981, and it just sells like mad. You know, very quickly it sells over a million machines. Well, the other divisions at IBM, there was a guy, group that did the low-end business computer called Data Master, and a group that did the word processor called Display Writer. Those two divisions said, these guys are out of control. They're, they're selling a machine cheaper than ours. They're messing up our market. They're messing up business computing and word processing. So they both bid to take over the personal computer division right. down in Boca. And they said, remember, these guys are morons. Uh, right. And headquarters said, hey, wait a minute. 
This Boca thing is pretty dynamic. This thing is going well. So they actually took this guy, Don Estridge, who ran the PC division, and they put him in charge of those other two divisions. Right. Uh, and so IBM, in some ways, you know, like many companies moving forward, they were actually fairly enlightened about a lot of key steps, and other key steps they weren't. The particular contract we had with them was we were very explicit that if anybody else does computers, they're, you know, we need to make more money than we're making from you, IBM. You didn't pay us enough for, for, to keep us happy the rest right. of our lives. You don't own our company. So we have to be able to sell it to other people. And they understood there were IBM 360 compatible machines up there. So they understood that we had kept that upside. The nature of the value of that, there was one guy at IBM who objected to their contract that he actually thought, hey, maybe we sh shouldn't do this. And he was overridden. Well, later he tried many projects inside the company to replace us, but they just, they weren't fanatics. But basically. had he not been overridden, that would have been the, that was the most expensive decision IBM ever made, I assume. No? Uh, yes and no. The IBM PC was not guaranteed to be successful. Uh, okay. There were lots of personal computers, you know, Commodore, Apple, Radio Shack. What happened was there was a sort of generational leap that the group at Boca Raton and we decided, and Intel was part of this, decided to move them up to a slightly more powerful machine. And because it was good and because it came from IBM, it became a template. Right. Now, I believe 16-bit computing would have happened, and you know, even if IBM hadn't been part of that. But it's hard, it's hard to go back and you okay. know, consider those other, other pathways. Um, you know, IBM you know, did very well. They made a lot of money on personal computers for a long time, and then eventually uh, sold off that division. But it was, uh, do you think, it, if, had Apple licensed its software to people, in those days they didn't uh, have open software, or open uh, systems, I guess, open architecture, so they didn't license it, you think that would have made a difference in your company? Yeah, we actually told Apple they made a mistake on the Macintosh, not licensing it to other companies. And we were, because we, we had applications that ran on the Macintosh. Strangely, we made more money when a Macintosh was sold than we did when an IBM PC was sold. Because the dominant word processor on the PC was word perfect. And the dominant word processor and spreadsheet and I database see. on the Mac was the software we had written. So we kept telling Apple, who almost went bankrupt, you know, please license your software. It's the only way you can get the scale of economics. Now, the irony is that you know, they fired their CEO. They brought Steve back. They've continued on the model of building their own hardware. And they've made it work fantastically, not only right. for their computers, their tablet, their phones. So you can go it on your own, but it, you know, it's just a different model. The Microsoft model is to support all the hardware companies. And the Apple model is to do their own hardware. Okay. And uh, now, when you wrote your first book about uh, uh, you know, your company and your life, um, I don't think you mentioned very much the internet, it is said, in that book. Maybe I'm wrong. But, um, and did you foresee the internet coming along, or, or did it surprise you and how, how important it became as part of the whole computer generation? Yes and no. Um, it's easy for an answer like this to sound uh, not humble. Uh, the, the book talks. It, the book we wrote ahead, you know, talks all about information superhighway, right. which was the stupid term at the time. It sounds right. very antiquated. Uh, but yes, yes and no. I mean, the internet is this mind-blowing thing that has completely changed the rules for everything. So there are some elements of it that all sorts of people in the computer industry were talking about for a long time. Now, we kept expecting it to happen, and it never happened, it never happened. And then all of a sudden, it took off. And so I don't think any of us sort of realized why it didn't happen for the five years before right. it did. Then, of course, once it did happen, it's one of those unbelievable phenomena. The more people who are connected, the more people want to be connected. And the volume means that the stuff right. gets cheaper. And these idiotic investors completely overinvested in these internet companies. They, they sent like $100 billion of silly money to try all sorts of companies, a few of which, like Google and AOL and others, eBay, actually survived. But the net return on that money between 1996 and 2001 uh, of building infrastructure and building websites, you know, 90% of them were laughable. 
right. so it's like a sock puppet uh, type right. thing that people invested hundreds of millions into that thing. Anyway, that phenomena was mind blowing uh, because it had such a powerful dynamic. So no, we didn't see that. Some of these applications were what we and everybody else were why we were doing the personal computer right. in the first place. Now, in your current position, you can see almost anybody in the world, I assume, and um, I assume you're not turned down for a lot of meetings. Um, uh, but who would you say are among the most impressive you know, government or business leaders you've met over the years? Uh, are there people that stand out as being so talented or so uh, far-sighted that you can remember that what they said to you or you're very impressed with them? Well, I, I think I, Warren Buffett probably gives me the best uh, advice about the world, the business, and how things are going. I, you know, I, I'm constantly learning from Warren uh, because you know he's just amazing, and he puts things in a, a simple to understand fashion. I've gotten to meet a lot of great political leaders. Nelson Mandela was probably the most inspiring, and because if anybody had predicted what would have happened in that power transition, they would have predicted lots and lots of bloodshed. And uh, really, it's I think it's his unbelievable inside his personality uh, and, and his that thoughtfulness applies to lots of things uh, so he's been quite amazing I still have a soft spot for scientists people who just spend their time taking a problem you know like designing a new toilet uh, which is not a very glamorous problem but you can actually have this huge impact on humanity right. designing a better uh, wheat seed for Africa designing a plant that makes its own fertilizer. Some of these ideas, some of which are the cheap fruition, there's others where people are just going to toil their whole life. You know, some will work out, some will not work out. So I, you know, I always love uh, finding somebody like that who's doing great work. Let me ask you, you, you've met a lot of political figures and you're in Washington today, I guess, meeting some members of Congress. Um, has it ever occurred to you that you could do their job better than them and you ever thought of running for office? No, I could not do their job better than them. Uh, it's, it doesn't, I don't think it would draw my best talent out, uh, meeting with constituents, raising money. Uh, I, don't, I mean, it's very important. And it, it's interesting, if you think of the history of the country, it's been very well run. Right. And so whenever you look at politics and think, oh my god, what a mess, you have to say, well, it's always worked out before. Does this just happen to be the time it looks like it's not going to work out? Right, right. Uh, <laughs> no. It sure feels that way. Yeah, uh, you probably wouldn't have to spend a lot of time raising money, though, if you got into politics. But, um, <laughs> but I, now, now, you know, what do you consider, like, you're, you're, you're 55 years old. So that's relatively young for somebody to have the worldwide stature that you have. Usually people often become the most famous person and one of the most influential people in the world, even at a later age. You're one of the most respected men in the world and people in the world, one of the most influential in the world, 55 years old. What would you like to see as your legacy? And what would you like to do for the next, let's say, 25 years of your active life, assuming you have 25 years at least? What do you want to do in the next 25 years? And what would you like, ultimately, your legacy or legacies to be? Well, the, the global health area I, I love because it's so concrete and it's so impactful. Um, Last year, a uh, little under 9 million children died before the age of 5. And in the next 15 years, we should be able to cut that in half. Uh, in the next 25 years, we should be able to cut that down to about 2 million. Uh, and you know that has this huge effect in terms of reducing sickness and uh, reducing right. population growth. And so you know, all it takes is about 10 new vaccines getting them invented and getting those distributed out to lots of people. So that's going to be, uh, you know, unless things go way better than I expect, it'll be most of the rest of my life I'll be working on that global health mission. Now we'll have some wonderful milestones along the way. In the next three or four years, we think we can achieve polio eradication. And that's the thing I'm spending the most time on today uh, because it requires making sure that even in these tough times, the money gets raised, the political will is there. There's a little bit of scientific work that still needs to be done to tune up these vaccines. They're not, they're not quite uh, as good as they need to be. So there'll be very neat things along right. the way uh, that happen there. In education, 
You know, education today is not much different than it was 50 or 60 years ago. I mean, if you take an almost any endeavor, uh, engineering or uh, you know, medical understanding, whatever you want to take, the pace, the improvement in the last 50 years has been incredible. In education, that's just not the case. If you said the best teacher was some you know, 1960 teacher, nobody could prove you wrong. So the idea that there is a system where teachers learn from each other, where the, these amazing teachers, which exist, that you actually analyze why they're so good, and maybe you can't be as good as they are, but you could be a lot more like them. That, having an evaluation system that encourages that improvement, and having technology come in so that a student can have the world's best lectures. A student can be analyzed, and you can see what you know and what you don't know. You can be motivated in terms of examples that are of interest to you. Anyway, I think you know, I'd love to see big success in the helping the world's poorest, which is health and agriculture. And I'd love to see big success in education. And you know, outside of my family life, if, if those things can be achieved, that would be worth the, the next 50 years. Well, now you have um, three children. And um, you know, I, what would you do if your son or daughter went to college and said, I want to drop out and start a company? I mean, how would you face that uh, kind of situation? Well, I, I wouldn't be able to say no, uh, but I think it is kind of an exceptional situation when it's logical to not complete your education. Um, so I, I'd probably resist as much as my dad did. Um, and, you know, hopefully, hopefully the kid has a passion. Being willing to tell your parents that they're wrong, you know, is almost an acid test. If, if your parents' objection makes you say, oh, okay, I'll go back to school, then you probably weren't meant to drop right, out and right, start a right. company. Uh, and how do you keep your, your family life relatively normal? I mean, for example, do you, you drive your children to school or pick them up from time to time? And you drive, when you're driving down the streets in Seattle, people stare at you or, you know, they see you in a car and driving or? No, people are great. It, it's, um, you know, I get to work with lots of smart people. I get uh, taking the kids into school. Everybody's just focused on their kid. Um, you know, it's, we meet lots of families through our kids. Uh, it, you know, we do our best, and the kids are, are you know, a lot of fun learning things with them. I'm very envious of my children because today, if you're curious about something, you can, you can find out about it. You know, with your parents, go watch, read a Wikipedia article, go watch a YouTube video. Uh, whereas when I was young and I asked my parents a lot of those questions, they said, hey, you know, what do, it, but we don't have an answer. Do you have limits on how much time your children can spend on the computer? I, I would if they showed signs of uh, extreme behavior like I did. Um, <laughs> but presumably no, no limits on Xbox, I assume. No, I would. I would have limits on all those things. I mean, everything's you know, in moderation. You want your kids to read a lot, but not to the exclusion mm -hmm. of other things. You want them to do sports. You want them to be, do things with friends. Striking that balance is hard. You know, that's why that tiger mother thing was right. such an interesting thing to send around because, you know, you know, what, what is too much, you know, and what balance should the kid have? And everybody draws those lines differently. But so far, none of my kids have shown uh, such, such tendencies that we actually had to, to make a but, quota. Now, Warren Buffett famously said he wasn't going to give his children any money, and he ultimately gave them a foundation to kind of uh, monitor and minister and, and give away money from. In your case, are you, do you have plans on how much you might leave your children, or would you, how, how do you deal with the enormous wealth you have in your children and, and the effect it would have on them? Well, I'll give them, uh, my wife and I will end up giving them a very, very small percentage the goal, of course, is to give a kid uh, enough. A small so, percentage is still probably a lot. <laughs> that's, that's okay. But you want to give them enough so they can do anything, but they can't do nothing. Right. Now, it's not clear what that number is. Right. And you know, I'm sure we'll, we'll think about right. it as time goes on. It's, it's a tricky problem, because every kid should have a chance to make their own way. Their friends and associates shouldn't think about, of them as somebody who's been handed this right. strange position. But you know, then again, they do get a great education. They get exposed to neat things. And so they're getting one of the, the best deals in life. And from time to time, they'll say, remind me why you're not giving me right. any money. Uh, right. 
Well, and we, it's great, actually, when they'll ask about something specific, like, well, but at least you'll give me a car, right? right. And I think, good, we've got the bidding really right, low right. here. Right. Uh, <laughs> So when you, when you go to buy something, uh, do you ever, are you ever short of cash, or do you have a credit card, or, I mean, do you carry cash, or do you have a credit card? I mean, you show a credit card, people say, oh, sure, that's really you. I mean, they... Yeah, actually, in my name, my, my name is William H. Gates III, and so whenever I would take my dad's credit cards, they would say, William H. Gates Jr., and I would use them when I was young, they'd say, well, you're too young. I'd say, no, it says Junior right, right there. there. Uh, yeah. But... You know, it's been more trouble right. than it's worth to have the same name as my dad uh, for both he and I, I think. So, uh, no, I don't carry much. I, I, I don't have a problem with okay. Getting carrying it. money. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, we have some time. Uh, oh, one last question before we ask the audience. I, you, you said your foundation would probably not stay around too many years after your wife and, and you leave uh, the earth. Um, is that for a reason? Why don't you want to have a perpetual foundation like the Ford Foundation, Rockefeller? What's your thinking? Well, Rockefeller and Carnegie and, and some other foundations that are perpetual have done an amazing job. Rockefeller Foundation uh, at many times picked total causes that were totally out of the mainstream, deworming, uh, schools for, for black children, uh, medical research, University of Chicago, they just did an incredible job. Right. So every, everyone should aspire to that level. I don't think, though, at least for, our, for Melinda and I, having a perpetual foundation makes sense because you, there are serious problems today, like these childhood health problems or uh, education. And the people who are rich today and have energy should focus their, their resources on those problems. And there'll be rich people in the future who can know very well what those problems are. And so, you know, there's a foundation in the U.S. that you know, has to give most of its money in one county. And right. it's a gigantic foundation. It makes no sense. It's very hard to anticipate what will happen in the future and pick people who will stay true to it. So we're probably going to have the foundation uh, last something like 20 years after the last of us to go. Because this vaccine mission that we're involved right. in, some of these things, we've built up a team and a staff, and you should have continuity. It's, it's worthwhile somebody doing that. But when you pick a time frame where that particular mission will end, then the money should, should, should be spent and someone else okay. uh, can form a new foundation. Okay. Um, any questions? Uh, anybody curious to ask a question? Okay. We have one back there. If somebody can get a mic. By the way, you stay out of politics now. You don't endorse candidates, I assume, or is that what you're pretty apolitical? I try. Right, okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, you, uh, you retired at a pretty young age, and I was wondering if, uh, if you have any trust, uh, what was your, had something to do with essentially uh, kind of making the market more well, the antitrust experience, I don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, when your own government goes after you, then all the other governments of the world say, oh, great, now we can really go after them too. You're just lying out there in the field bleeding, and every vulture <laughs> is coming to, to get you. Anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting experience. Um, but no, I, I wouldn't say it had necessarily affected my timing. I always knew that Microsoft was a company that whoever was leading the technology strategy should be, uh, shouldn't be 60 or older. And so I chose to retire earlier in my 50s than I might have guessed I would have when I was in my 30s. But I knew it was in that range, 50 to 60. And what happened was my dad, Patty Stone Cyphers, did such a good job on the foundation that I felt like both my impact and my ability to learn lots of new things would actually be higher at the foundation right. than at Microsoft. You never know on these things, uh, but we had a, a great, great team at Microsoft, and I, I made the change. Okay. Other question here? Go ahead. Thank you. Could you please talk about the relationship between agriculture and health and the expressed intent of the new leadership in Congress to defund global agricultural development? Well, the, yeah, I didn't 
talk much about agriculture, but other than the health vaccine things we do for the poorest, the next really sizable thing we do is get involved in agricultural research. That is helping farmers have better seeds, access to fertilizer, and that is super catalytic. Over 70% of the poor people in the world are farmers with very small plots of land who have a hard time feeding their family, and the vagaries of weather uh, are very tough on them. And yet there is this potential to give them better tools, uh, better information, and uh, particular better seeds that will help them deal with that weather vari variability and get enough output to have cash crops as well as subs subsistence. It's great that the, the world actually spent a lot on agriculture in the 70s and 80s, the so-called Green Revolution, although Rockefeller, Ford Foundation were central to that, World Bank and government funding for roads and fertilizer, it was a miracle. We more than doubled the uh, output, and in many cases tripled the output of, of farmers. Now we need to do that again. Uh, Africa didn't get the benefit of that first round, but even in Asia we need to get yields up. And the U.S. government has funded some of this and was definitely talking about some increases, made a few increases. Now it's one of those things that's kind of up in the air in terms of the overall budget picture. Is that something that will be maintained or will it be cut? Uh, and there is a proposal where most of it gets cut and there's a proposal where most of it gets maintained and we'll see right. where it comes out. Okay, a question uh, here, right here, your question. <clears throat> For a fun question here, what's your golf handicap and do you ever take mulligans when you play? Uh, yeah, I, I haven't, I was uh, with some friends at Augusta just last week, which is my once a year, I go once a year, and I hadn't golfed for six months, but I'd played tennis on that. Well, tennis, hey, that's kind of the same. Uh, that didn't work for me. Uh, so I think I was probably golfing to about a 24 handicap uh, when it was all said and done. But people don't like the putts. I mean, they just give you the putts, I assume, a lot of people know. Not, well, no, we usually have a $1 bet, and so that makes them uh, take it all pretty seriously. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, back here. Yes, I'm wondering if you might comment on our recent mayoral election here. As a resident of the District of Columbia and also as an entrepreneur who's headquartered my business here, the outcome was very disappointing with regards to the education and um, maybe a lack of support of that referendum. So... I'd like to hear your two cents on that. Well, Washington, D.C. is a system of contrasts. Um, you know, in many ways, many of the statistics would tell you it's uh, one of the worst school districts in the country. Uh, it is a school district that has a lot of charter schools, and a lot of those charter schools are quite amazing. There's a KIPP charter school, there's a SEED charter school, and those charter schools not only are providing great education, They've actually been laboratories to learn about things like if you have kids from the inner city who have a very uh, a tough, tough background, can you do well with them? And when KIPP achieved 90% of their kids going to four-year colleges, spending money at about the same rate as the normal public schools, it, that was a phenomenal thing. Now, the tactics they used, long school day, going in on Saturdays, really getting the commits involved in strong relationships, those are key things that are, have proven difficult to map over to the normal public school system, but I think it's a, a huge contribution. The work that Michelle Reed did to put in a teacher evaluation system, you know, we were supportive of that because we believe that over time, evaluation systems can get very good. They can use test data, they can use cameras in the classroom, they can use student interviews. There's all sorts of ways to create a system that's fair and encourages improvement and, and takes the compensation somewhat away from the pure seniority basis that it's been to date. The jury's out on what's going to happen in the DC school system. Will they continue to drive forward in terms of the evaluation system, making it better and really running the system in a strong way on behalf of the kids? Um, you know, so it, it'll be interesting to see Around the country, there's a lot of school districts that are trying out teacher evaluation. The whole state of Colorado passed a law. There's six districts that our foundation is funding these new systems in, some in partnership with unions uh, that you know, they've been a, a good partner in those places. So I think 
I think it, we will get great evaluation systems, and I think the DC experience will contribute to that, um, you know, and I hope it, it stays in the vanguard. Okay, I have one more question. We have time for one more right here. If somebody can bring a mic. Or I'm right here? Okay, I'm sorry. You've, the last you've, talked, question. you've talked a bit about how the, one of the advantages in the global health arena is that you have very concrete goals to point at and to focus on. And, and recognizing the K through 12 or, or you know, domestic higher education or domestic education space is a little more political and perhaps it's a little more challenging. With 25% or so of the foundation's resources still focused in that area, I am interested to hear a little bit more about um, you know, what are the concrete goals that you believe define success in that arena for the foundation? Yeah, we have goals in our K through 12 education um, some of which are the goals that are under our control. That is, how much does the field understand great teachers? And do we have examples of all the key things great teachers do to make the subject interesting, to calm down the classroom, to help the kid who's behind, to engage the kid who's ahead? You know, there's all these things that these great people do, and you should be able to uh, submit your video to a website, have somebody critique your teaching, have them point you to examples where those things are done well. So the research on great teaching, that can be done. It's amazing how little has been done on that. Over the next three years, that will get done. And, and people can take advantage of it or not, but that's a key goal. The role of technology in the classroom and helping kids know where they are, uh, you know, there's a huge opportunity there. Having the best lectures available for kids to watch online. That's something we can make sure it happens. Uh, there's a website called Khan Academy, K-H-A-N Academy.org, that if you want to see this in progress, uh, the work that Saul Khan has done, he's the creator of that website that we support and others do, is at the cutting edge. It's an amazing thing. If you want to be reminded of anything about math or science, if you want your kids to try it out, uh, I, I highly recommend it. So the technology piece, the research piece and the idea of what a good personnel system is, that can be designed. You know, for example, we've gone and, and asked students lots of questions. And it turns out two questions are very diagnostic of whether the teacher is good. You ask the kids, does your teacher use the time in the classroom well? And second, when you're confused, does the teacher help straighten you out? And that has a near perfect correlation with test scores and other uh, ways of evaluating kids. And you know, it's not hard to ask those, those questions. Then we have goals that are not under our control, which are reducing the dropout rate and increasing the number of kids in the United States who either get a college degree or get some type of uh, uh, post-secondary accreditation for some profession they want to go into. We have very ambitious goals there. Now, unfortunately, if you just, if you ignore the technology or personnel system, those trend lines are all in the wrong direction. That is, as health budgets soar, the funding for both higher education and K through 12 is uh, where that, that comes out of. You know, Pennsylvania today, you know, it's just an example. You know, they, they cut their higher ed funding by 50%. And so we really need some magic to achieve those goals. We're going to need the personnel system. We're going to need technology. We're going to need uh, to make sure that, that somehow, either by increasing revenue or being smart about health care, that we don't defund uh, the, 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 the level of investment that we make in education. So it's, it's a tough thing, but we do have metrics that we feel very directly responsible for. OK, well, thank you. I want to thank. Uh... Bill, for very much for giving us an hour of his time this evening. It's very enjoyable. And I want to thank you on behalf of all Americans for all the things you're doing, on behalf of our country and for the citizens around the world. And to thank you, uh, I wanted to give you two gifts that we have. Uh, let me get them now. Um, there's a small token of our appreciation. This is a reproduction of a map of the District of Columbia in 1791. Cool. And, um, and this is a flag that flew on the Capitol today. And thanks to Congressman Dingell and Debbie Dingell. Um, okay. 
So, thank them for that, and I appreciate everything you've done this evening, and I appreciate everything else you're doing for our country. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all.